Thank you for joining us for tonight's Situate Historical Society GAR Hall special event, Zoom edition. We've got a wonderful presentation tonight, but before we start, just got a few things I'd like to tell you. Um, we've got a great series running on this, um, this Zoom platform. We started at the middle of last year, as a lot of people did, and we found we've reached a huge audience. We've been able to pull in people from all over who otherwise wouldn't be able to see our presentations. And we've been able to have people come in who we wouldn't have been able to have. We have people from all over the country who have presented for us. So that's been fabulous. Um, we do offer these programs free of charge to the community. We don't, um, we don't ask for any money, but we suggest a donation if you are able to. They would always be welcome and very appreciated. So I'm going to put in the chat <clears throat> section of your screen after um, Frank begins um, our PayPal address, which is PayPal me SHS 1636, and then our mailing address, which was 43 Cudworth Road. And um, if you are able to, a donation would be greatly appreciated. So without further ado, I guess, um, we're going to present Situate Fisheries. We have three wonderful, um, uh, I, I don't even know how to describe them all. They're just terrific. We've got longtime fishermen, entrepreneurs. We've got, a, we've got Kevin who's still out on a boat. We've got Joby who's starting a, a fabulous new processing plant. We have Frank that's got more knowledge and more experience than anybody around. And we're proud and privileged to have them here tonight. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Frank Meraki. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for attending. Welcome to our presentation on Situate Fisheries, where we came from, where we are today, and where we hope to evolve. We have three presenters. I am Frank Meraki. I began my fishing career in 1962 as a summer deckhand on the Francis Elizabeth. In the 1950s, my family had bought a pleasure boat more than the harbor. I developed an intense curiosity about the fishermen, mostly lobstermen then, that I'd see loading bait or parts at the town pier. After high school, I was lucky to get aboard the Francis Elizabeth through a mutual acquaintance. I worked there until 1967, learning how to mend and where the toes were located. I bought my first boat, the Kathleen A. Meraki, in 1967. I fished until 2015, owning and operating a succession of three boats, the Kathleen, the Christopher Andrew, and finally the Barbara Peters. My part of tonight's talk will be about the history of fishing in situate and some rudiments of fishery management, how it has evolved and how it impacts the people who fish. The second presenter will be Kevin Norton. Kevin is an active situate fisherman. Kevin will describe the complexities of fishing today in a heavily regulated environment. Our final presenter will be Joby Norton. Joby has been the owner of Mulaney's Fish Market for about 20 years. He is currently in the process of opening a brand new facility on Allen Place in the harbor, as well as continuing the operation at his Cohasset store. Joby will walk us through the new place and describe how it will connect the South Shore community with the wonderful bounty of seafood available right off our shore. Uh -oh. Why is my slide not moving? We have a problem. There we go. Okay. Sorry, I'm new to this. Um, probably most of you have passed this spot. For some, it might be a bit of an enigma. Engines roar to life at 4 a.m., trucks come and go. When the wind turns east, the smell of lobster bait can grab your attention. There's a lot of history here. The little basin between today's pier and the Mill Wharf was once the heart of Situate Harbor. Between TK's and the package store and the New Salt Society was once Old Dock Street, a public way. There was a marine railway, storage shed, and several docks on wooden pilings. The Lucky Finn Coffee Shop, which formerly was known as the Quarter Deck, and before that, Hank Carver's Lobster Pound sat, sat on pilings that are left from one of these. 
Here is a view of the granite pier that existed from the 19th century until 1936. This pier was built upon a rough breakwater structure originally built to protect the harbor basin from easterly storm swells. The jetties that reach out from Cedar Point and First Cliff were originally shorter and lower than they are today. Approaching the pier is one of the small coastal ferries that served as transportation, primarily for tourism. It was a freight dock located where the Mill Wharf Marina sits today. Here, schooners unloaded cargoes such as lumber, coal, granite, and animal feed. Here's another shot showing a restaurant. Who'd have thought it, a restaurant on the pier with a ferry dock behind? Notice the scarcity of houses on first cliff seen in the background. I had the privilege to see portions of this old pier in 1987 when a reconstruction project excavated the area. A steel sheet piling pier was built in 1936 around this old granite structure. This was in turn reconfigured from the L shape that some of you probably remember into the rectangular structure that we all see today. Here's another view taken from where the Mill Wharf restaurant sits today, looking at the pier. In the background, you can see the shoreline, uh, Museum Beach. Notice the scarcity of houses, a few houses there were then and how densely populated the shoreline is today. Here's a view of the steel pier shortly after it was built, probably about 1936. It's empty of boats. Here is a view of the structure that now supports the Lucky Finn in its original status as a lobster dog. Notice the lobster car float in the foreground where live lobsters were kept awaiting sale. Also, look at the elm trees in the background. These beautiful trees graced both sides of Front Street until the 1950s when they died of Dutch elm disease. Here's a shot of a navigational chart that dates back into the early 1950s. Note a few things. There's no coal parkway. Also notice the area that we know now as the inner or back harbor is mostly salt marsh and tidal creeks. The area was dredged during the 1950s using a hydraulic dredge. Sediment was deposited into dike-like lagoons built on top of the salt marsh. The trees growing between Stage House Beach and First Cliff and those along the side of Edward Foster Road behind the old Bay Bank are growing on that fill land. I can remember vividly the stench of hydrogen sulfide, the rotten egg gas released by the dredging. It turned many of the houses on the cliffs yellow. The settlement of portions of Coal Parkway near the bandstand where it floods it today at high tide are due to compaction of this dredge spoil material. Here's a bit of poetic license I'm using to illustrate how fish were preserved before refrigeration was available. The view on the right is the shingle mound that we now know as Stage House Beach, directly across from the pier and behind the, the, uh, the uh, Lucky Finn. It has shifted significantly since I first saw it. The view on the left are fish stages, drying wax where salted fish, probably cod, were dried in the sun. The shot was taken in Gloucester, but it is fair to say that situates fishermen most likely use a similar strategy to preserve their catches. Getting to more modern times, I have literally hundreds of photos of boats taken at the town pier. I chose this one because it's emblematic. It shows two old friends and fellow fishermen, Roly Bedard on the right and behind him, Charlie Butman sharing some thoughts as we were docking sometime in 1976. Fishing is, much, is as much about relationships as it is about boats. I hope there's a coffee shop in heaven where these guys can hang out and swap sea stories. Here's the top here today, getting busy. This was taken last fall. Different boats, mostly different people, but showing the same dogged determination to carry on as we have done in the past. And speaking of determination, here's where all of Situate was tested to the limit. The blizzard of 1978. The Lucid and the Lady Irma, the two boats you see in the background, survived the blizzard. 
It was a miracle that these two boats, owned by brothers Tom and Bob Steverman, stayed afloat. You can see in the foreground two sunken vessel and windrows of floating debris, mostly from destroyed homes on Cedar Point. The pier surface and much of Front Street was covered with lumber, making it impassable for days. At the time, the pier was about two feet lower than it is today, making it vulnerable to tidal flooding. The pier surface was raised to its present height in 1987. We have just passed the 43rd anniversary of the blizzard. The resilience of the people of Situate has enabled us to recover and to rebuild. Now we shift gears a little bit and we're going to talk about fishery management. A little bit more boring and perhaps a little bit more generic, but really, really important to understanding where we are today and where we hope to go. It's great to be well managed, but the status comes with a cost. In the next few minutes, we will follow the transition from the wild west of open fisheries I encountered in 1962 to the heavy handed system fishermen work under today. Here's something that we haven't seen around for a long time a Russian trawler. Um, the Russian vessels like this are what precipitated a law called the Fishery Conservation and Management Act. It was originally championed by one of our state, uh, excuse me, our federal congressman, uh, Gary Studs. The law was adopted by Congress and signed by Ger President Gerald Ford in 1976. It declared American jurisdiction over the living resources inhabiting the waters within 200 miles of the coast and gave management authority to the National Marine Fisheries Service. Seems like this grainy photo from here were a catalyst for this transformation. After World War II, the USSR made it a national policy to develop fisheries to feed their citizens. Vessels from Poland, East Germany, and Lithuania became dominant on Georgia's and Brown's banks, which had heretofore been exclusive areas for US and Canadian fishermen. I can personally remember seeing East German midwater trawlers fishing for herring on Middlebank, which is now known as Stellwagen Bank, through the 1960s. Catches for the offshore fleets from Boston and Gloucester plummeted, causing most of the large vessels, known then as beam trawlers, to cease fishing. Public pressure built to do something. Multinationalists, free traders, and the military pushed back, fearing loss of navigational freedom. The tipping point came when Iceland and Ecuador declared extended fishery jurisdictions. Within two years, almost every nation had an exclusive economic zone, most of set at 200 nautical miles from the coast. So in summary, the FCMA became effective in 1977. It declared a 200 mile fishing limit, but it also created eight regional fishery management councils to set fishery management policy. This is kind of unusual in governance. Usually the government tells you what to do here. The general policy is set by this group. It's comprised partly of governor, government officials and partly of private citizens. I had the, the privilege of serving on the council in the early to mid 1990s. Uh, a number of fishermen uh, serve on the council today. So the New England region is governed by the New England Fishery Management Council, which governs basically the five New England states that abut on the ocean. Um, so the jurisdiction of the council is basically uh, beyond state waters. Uh, state waters are still under the jurisdiction of the individual states and they're in Massachusetts are managed by the Massachusetts Division of Marine Fisheries. Interstate coastal fisheries, examples of which are striped bass, fluke, menhaden, are uh, managed by the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission and the ocean fisheries, for example, the Northeast multi-species which we'll talk about in a moment, lobsters and scallops, which are jointly managed, are managed by the National Marine Fish, which is a division of the National Oceanic Atmosphere Administration, known as NOAA, which is in the Department of Commerce. Moving ahead, a quick history. Um, in 19, th this is how management itself has evolved. Beginning in 1997, the National Marine Fisheries Service uh, established broad scale quotas for major regional stocks. Quotas were issued on a quarterly basis. Quotas were often quickly harvested, resulting in frequent fishery closures, meaning there was a feast and then there was a famine. 
which really disrupted supply chains and made local fish un un unavailable at times and in oversupply at other times. Landing limits for managed stocks were imposed to buffer harvest rates, but these were undermined by an extraordinary growth in the number of vessels, much of which was driven by subsidies, basically free money from the government for new vessels construction. New brownfish permits were issued without limit until 1994. <clears throat> at that time, permit numbers were frozen at about 1,200 where they remain today. They're still frozen at that level. A vessel buyback program was initiated. Eventually about 150 active vessels were destroyed and their associated permits were invalidated. This period exemplifies a fundamental problem with fisheries known as the tragedy of the commons, a term coined by ecologist Garrett Hardin in 1968. This hypothesis sees the benefits of privatizing a common resource such as grazing lands or even fresh water or of course fish as accruing to the few while the cost of depletion is borne by everyone. Fisheries have historically been subject to overexploitation driven by this behavior. I should note that fisheries do not always lead to overfishing. Examples exist where a fishery is controlled by a single authority, for example, an isolated community or a native tribe, which have common interests will, and which will enable self-governance. An interesting work by a sociologist named Eleanor Ostrom uh, provides uh, interesting examples of how this model has worked well. It doesn't work when international competition or power imbalances prevail. However, in a world riven by nationalism and self-governance, uh, by national, nationalism, self-governance does not hold up well. Amendment 5, a turning point. In 1990, the, the uh, groundfish stocks were extraordinarily low levels. A environmental organization known as the Conservation Law Foundation, you perhaps know it as CLF, uh, filed suit against the National Marine Fisheries Service that year arguing that the agency had failed in its responsibility to achieve maximum sustainable, sustainable yield, which is the mandate of the law that was generated by Congress. A negotiated settlement resulted and in the uh, in 1994 enactment of Amendment 5. A little bit of history. My first day on the council, I was, we were all ushered into a small private room and told by the NOAA general counsel, a lawyer that represented the agency at the meetings, that they had settled this case with the Conservation Law Foundation, no hearing, and that we had a year to fix it. You know, the biggest mess in my entire life, and we had a year to fix it. Well, we didn't. It took us two years. And what we ended up doing is the following. We froze the number of permits and limited upgrades on any replacement vessels. We eliminated quotas and instead established an effort control system using a day at sea as a mechanism to control mortality. And we established total allowable, to, to, a target total allowable catches instead of hard quotas, allowing adjustments in days at sea in subsequent years to compensate for the over harvests, trying to avoid this feast and famine, boom and bust, and now it's open, now it's closed situation that we had dealt with in preceding years. In 2008, Congress again reauthorized the Magnuson Act. Basically it means they changed things around again. Um, the law requires it to be reauthorized every eight years. It's not. It was supposed to have been reauthorized again in 2016. They still haven't acted on it. Here it is 2021. Go figure. In 2008, Congress decided that overages in fish catches had to be dealt with in the current, not in subsequent years, making the target TACs or currently allowable catches, again, illegal. In response, the National Marine Fisheries Service and the New England Council developed Amendment 16, which became effective in 2010. Amendment 16 was probably the greatest challenge that fishermen had ever encountered. Days at sea were replaced by an allocation for each groundfish stock. This was based on each permit's historic catches during the baseline period. The amendment initiated was known as a cap and trade program, whereby both active and inactive permits could transfer a quota among themselves while keeping aggregate catches below the established annual limit. The amendment also created organizations known as sectors. Okay, so what are we fishing for? 
the Northeast multi-species complex, which is also known to common folk as ground fish, can consist of 13 species, cod, haddock, white haddock, pollock, redfish, different kinds of flatfish, windowpane flounder, which is another flatfish, wolffish, and ocean pot, which are three species that cannot be landed. And then bycatch species that are caught incidentally with the multi-species, primarily skates, monkfish, and whiting. So what is a sector? The sector is a nonprofit 501c5 corporation. Membership in the sector is voluntary, but, big but, 98% of groundfish are harvested by sector fishermen. Sectors allow members to buy, sell, or trade fish quota within and between sector members. The majority of pituate groundfish fishermen are members of blah, 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 sector 12, where all the fancy Roman numerals are basically a creation of the bureaucracy, we call ourselves Sector 12. Whoops, I hope we shot one. So, Sector, excuse me, there we go. Sectors have become a survival mechanism for most groundfish dependent fishermen. A sector manager helps track each permit quotas, each permit holder's use of quota. She will notify the fishermen when their quota balance gets low and will seek a source from which more can be obtained. Quota can come from within a sector or from any of about 18 active sectors as well. The sector acts as a broker, often funding a purchase until a fisherman can convert it into cash flow. Some of the interesting things that sector has done is it's enabled us to fish in a much more selective way. Here's a couple of shots that just kind of illustrate how really clean and selective fishing has become from a, just a, stuffing a pile of fish on the deck to something like this. This is a catch of almost perfectly clean haddock that was taken uh, in 2018. Here's a mixed catch of cod and yellowtail flounder that was taken in 2016, I believe. Yes. Um, here's an interesting shot. These are whiting, a silver hake taken with a specialized net. This shot was taken in Cape Cod Bay um, in 2000 and kind of page here, 2012. So these are all different fisheries, same boats, different nets, different strategies, different target species, and we're getting pretty good at doing this. And I, my final shot is this picture of a oh my god catch of codfish that was taken in again 2012. This is what's called a feeding aggregation of codfish. Codfish are a schooling fish, more, though, more so than probably any of the groundfish species. And uh, when they get hungry, they, they just basically create a, a mass of fish. There's two uh, causative factors that cause them to, to, uh, to gather like this. The first is feeding, which we're looking at here, and the second is spawning. When they get together, they're almost like, it's really fascinating. They're like um, salmon, but instead of spawning in freshwater, the cod go to discrete places in the ocean. How they get there, I have absolutely no idea, but every year they go back to the same place and they form these enormous masses of fish. Situate fishermen were um, basically leaders in the move to close these spawning aggregations to fishing because it's senseless to kill the fish when they're trying to reproduce themselves. So we now have a whole patchwork of different closures at different times so that huge catches like this basically don't occur. And we're able to target more on species of fish that are in great abundance. We'll see a little bit about that uh, in, in a moment. Um, so what else can sectors do? Uh, three things, cooperative research, ocean cleanup, and local sourcing and improved food supply. Here's three case studies. Situate boats are participating in abundance surveys sponsored by the National Marine Fishery Service and the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Basically, they're exploring areas into which government surveys don't venture, providing a more complete picture of the status of fish populations that would otherwise be available. Situate fishermen have also participated in a program called Fishing for Energy. It's a recycling program. With help from the town of Situate, we have recovered 120 tons of debris from the ocean in the past five years. And then finally, fish, situate fishermen are currently recipients of several grants from the Massachusetts Food Infrastructure Security Program, 
and we've established a nonprofit called Friends of Social Seafood Development. With this organization, we in the future we will be supplying fresh local fish to the Situate Food Pantry, as well as several other local organizations. So here's a, just a shot to show you. This is the kind of material that the fishermen are collecting from the ocean on a day-to-day -day basis. These are just shots of piles of stuff. They're deposited on the pier. The Situate DPW and the Harbor Masters Office are kind enough to transport them to the transfer station. And uh, there, there's two special containers that are funded by the uh, National Fish and Wildlife Foundation, uh, operating under a grant uh, that the town of Situate applied for and has received. So at no cost of the town, this stuff is transported to a processing facility in Connecticut, where some of it is burned and converted to electricity, and some of it is salvaged for scrap steel. To close out, I'm almost done. Uh, here's a couple of little graphs just to illustrate something. These are really difficult to discern. I did the best I could, but the, the variability in these things is so great that it is kind of difficult to even see. But the vertical bars uh, showing relative abundance in the year to year, the years from 2016 to 2020, and each group of bars shows different species of fish on the left, Gulf of Maine cod, next Gulf of Maine haddock, next pollock, next redfish, then Gulf of Maine yellowtail, Gulf of Maine blackbacks, and finally another species of uh, blackfish called dabs. What this shows you is the huge discrepancy in abundance of these fish. These abundance numbers come from the government surveys augmented by the fishermen surveys, and it shows that there's a heck of a lot more pollock and redfish than there are cod yellowtail flounder or blackback flounder. This is a real problem because it makes it very difficult for fishermen that have large allocations of these big tall bars to get at these fish because they end up getting too many of the, of the more scarce species. And those represent, again, the choke stocks that keep them from fishing to fulfillment. So this is what's going on. The percentage harvested, again, each of these clusters are, um, the, the bars represent the same succession of years from 2016 to 2020, you can see. For the most part, the trend is down. This doesn't mean that the catches are down. This basically means that we're getting a smaller and smaller share of the allocated fish. So as the allocations go up, we're able to catch less and less of them. Uh, this tells you a couple of things. One is we're pretty good at selective fishing, but not good enough to get the optimum yield yet from the fishery. We're still working on gears and cooperative works, uh, strategizing how to maximize uh, these catches. Number two, it tells you there's a heck of a lot of potential out there to grow these fisheries. It's not like we're on the cusp anymore of a depleted fishery like we were back in the 1990s. We have an abundance of fish. A lot of them are species that are hard to access, but we're working at it. And I'm really confident that people that invest in the fishery like um, the new fish market we're gonna hear about in a moment, are going to be rewarded by this abundance of fish, and it will it will uh, flow as basically uh, a reward to the people of Situate as well. Um, so to close out, these fish landings uh, are contributors to the local economy and to food security, and they provide jobs. You know, I've estimated that for every job in a boat, if we're able to process fish in Situate and basically have a lot of it be retailed or uh, uh, provided through food service, restaurants or caterers, that we can create a job, a show for every job and a vote. And uh, you know, again, that leads to economic prosperity and food security. So I, I'm gonna close out with that. I really appreciate your um, listening so intently. And now we're gonna shift over to hear from uh, Kevin and from Joey. Thank you so much. Hi everybody, my name's Kevin Norton. I'm a, uh ground fishermen in Situate, Mass. Uh, thanks everyone for tuning in. Uh, Frank's a tough act to follow. He's very organized. I am not, so bear with me. Uh, I'll give, I'm just gonna give you a little rundown of what it's like to fish in Situate today. You know, right now in Situate, we have eight full-time uh, federal fishing boats. We have probably 20 full-time lobster boats, and we have uh, one new scalloper that's gonna start this year. Uh, and that what Frank was talking about, uh, the sector, we, we belong to sector 12, 
We're a group of fishermen. We work together. We work under the same set of rules, and we work with uh, a sector manager who's a family in situate. Our, our sector manager is, a, is, a, is one of the, the wives of one of the fishermen in situate. And uh, that, that's kind of what I wanted to get across to everybody today is we have a really, it's not a unique thing in situate, but it's a nice thing in situate where uh, it's all family businesses. You know, every, every boat you see on that pier is a local family. And, uh, you know, my boat right now, uh, I, this three, I, have, I have two other families working with me and my, and my kids work with me. And every other boat you see down that pier is, uh, is just another local family in situate. Uh, fishing, it, fishing in Situate is uh, it's a great spot to fish out of. It's a great community. We have a really good group of guys. It's a really nice community for it. Uh, fishing changes year to year. I mean, fishing's a really, it's, it's a tough business to be in. We get, you know, we get different rules every year. We have to follow different catch, uh, catch what we can catch each year. The last few years, haddock's been very abundant, so we've been mainly working on haddock. Uh, this last year has been, you know, extremely difficult with, with, with the COVID situation, with the restaurants being closed. Uh, it's, been, it's been very difficult for us to keep our businesses going. With, uh, we didn't realize how much that we do count on uh, restaurants, how much, how much that plays on our businesses. You know, we all, pretty, every boat in situate, we all work, we're all day boats. We go out, which basically means day boats mean we go out in the morning, we come home at night. We're bringing the best product we can. We're bringing a product that was, you know, uh, caught that day, iced that day, sold that day. So it's like the highest, uh, highest, uh, what am I trying to say here? <laughs> It's just a high, the best product we can, we can give people, you know. Um, so, uh, and we're also lucky that we have really good restaurants in town. You know, we have a really good group of restaurants in town that really want local seafood. So, uh, some of the challenges that we've had is, is just that, is, you know, we, is that we've had an, an ocean full of, of, of fish here. And uh, it, it's been a tough year just to, just to move it around. That's why I'm really looking forward to being able to process a lot of this fish right here in situate and not have to just you know throw this fish out into an open market where we basically throw it on a truck it gets shipped to boston or it gets shipped to new bedford and uh you know we get basically paid for it when somebody felt like paying us for it you know when the price fluctuation is what kills us where one day we can put four thousand pounds of fish on a truck and get paid eight thousand dollars for it the next day we can put four thousand pounds of fish on the truck and get paid you know, two thousand dollars for it, which doesn't even cover our expenses for the day. So the wild fluctuations in the market is just what really makes it tough for us to, you know, have a business plan and you know keep, you know, keep our keep keep everything up to date. The boats up, the boats in good shape. You know, it, it, it's like it's, it's uh, you know, we, we call them brokers and on, on fishing days. But I mean, there's no reason in this day and age you go out and catch beautiful seafood and come in and not get paid for it. So that's what we've really been working on here in Situate is, you know, uh, trying to figure out a way that we know what we're getting paid, you know, before we leave the dock. So that we know that, you know, we're, we're doing the right thing. If we're going out and, and targeting haddock, targeting flatfish, targeting, you know, codfish at times, that we're going to get paid for it. Uh, you know, the other thing too is, I think a lot of people, see, they see some of the stuff with Sector 12. I think a lot of people didn't really understand people see it on Facebook and they don't really understand what it is. And that's basically just the group of fishermen in situate work to get working together. And you know, uh, and the other thing too, it's, it's, uh, I know I'm kind of jumping around a little bit, but uh, just thinking of things people say to me over the time. And I've, a lot of people have said this summer, you know, like they see the pile of trash on the pier and they wonder what that is. You know, one time this summer I brought in two big couches and I had them on the pier. But that's the stuff that goes into the, uh, the recovery thing we're doing in the ocean where we, you know, we're, we're towing nets along the bottom of the ocean and it's, you know, we, we come across trash. So, you know, we bring it in in the town, we leave it on the pier, the harbor master brings it to the dump for us and puts it in the thing. But, you know, I think a lot of people sometimes see like a pile of trash on the pier and they I can just think them say to themselves, these fishermen are slobs, they have the trash all over the pier, but 
And like, it's just an explanation for people to realize that that trash that's on the pier is stuff that, you know, we're, we're taking our time. We're using our, you know, our guys are helping us. No one's getting paid for it, but it's just, you know, you know, that's where we work. That's where our resources and we try to keep it clean. And, um, and I just like people to a little bit of an explanation for people out there that, uh, to know exactly what goes on at that pier. Cause I think a lot of times people just drive by there and they don't understand that it's, you know, all family run businesses, all work in the same, at the same goal. And that goal is to get the most we can out of the ocean while keeping it clean and keeping, you know, local families working. And, and, you know, for me, a big part of it is, you know, I have my kids on the boat and it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a great thing to be out for the day and be with your kids and have kids interest in the fishing industry. The one problem with the fishing industry, because it's so highly regulated and because it's very expensive to get into now with the price of permits, the price of boats, uh, the amount of aggravation that we go through with, you know, changes in government rules that it's, it would be a very easy business to disappear where you wouldn't see new people get into it. So mm -hmm. I know, uh, but with the, with the people that are fishing out of the situation now, I mean, we're all worried about that, that, that just that thing that, you know, we're the last generation of fishermen because, you know, there's a lot, it takes, it takes a lot of knowledge to go out and catch fish. It takes a lot of knowledge to run a boat, you know, and you don't just learn it overnight, but if there's no one there to teach you, if we don't have guys like Frank around to teach guys like me and I don't, and I don't have my kids around to teach them, this is going to disappear. And, I don't know. The first thing I do when I pull into communities around anywhere around the coast is I go look at the fishing boats. I mean, it's just something that I do. And I think it's something that a lot of people do. And, uh, and I think it's kind of cool in situate that you can go down the pier almost any night in the summer at, you know, six, seven o'clock and watch a boat unload. You know, we always have kids down there, little kids, families. You know, I think it's just a, it's a really great part of situate. And I hate to see it lost. And, you know, I think with a little bit of help here, I think if people in the community are interested in buying a local product, you know, if, the, if, we, if we can get this fish market up and going, we can start processing some of our own catch. You know, I, I think that we can really see a very profitable fish pier. And we can see, you know, maybe we can see this go on for another generation, which would be, which would be something that I would be really happy about. So I don't know what else. I have like a little chicken scratch here on a piece of paper. I'm sure I'm going to forget half the stuff that I uh, was going to say here. Yeah. But I think that's about it. Uh, I'm looking at my notes, but oh, and, and uh, yeah. So I just want to thank everybody and hope, you know, we'll see you all this summer. We'll see you at the fish market. We'll see you down the pier. Come down and say hello. You know, uh, my name, my boat's the Miss Emily. And uh, we're in pretty much every night. Okay, thank you. So I'm turning it over to me. Uh, my name is Joby Norton. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Frank. Um, your presentation, I just touched on a couple of things that they said. You know, I, I think as Kevin was saying about the trash that they haul in, and I think a lot of people don't realize the trash that would end up on our beaches. Um, you know, that's a, that's a big part of the, the number of Franks at 110 or 120, you know, ton of fish that has been taken off out of the ocean for these guys and it's, it hasn't landed on our shores. It's a, it's a big tribute to them and I appreciate it. So well, <clears throat> my name is Joby Norton. Um, I own Mulaney's Fish Market in Situate and Mulaney's uh, Seafood in Cohasset. Um, I started 35 years ago actually this year unloading down the docks as a kid, unloading the fish onto, onto the, off the boats, onto the trucks and worked my way through high school, worked my way through college. After college, I was looking for my real job. Um, I kept working at Mulaney's and I really enjoyed it. I enjoyed the people in the industry and I stayed. And then in 2004, I believe I bought the company uh, from Chris Mulaney when he was very retired. So, you know, Mulaney has been around for 40 years. Um, we're in the process now of just finishing our new building which is a great state-of-the-art 
building here in Situate. Um, our old building was an old brick cape fish market that was waterlogged and falling apart. And now we've gone to a really a state-of-the-art building. We put a lot of thought and energy into the engineering and design of it. Um, it's an energy efficient building. All our refrigeration we put um, into the basement. We went down about 18 feet into the ground. This will keep the uh, refrigeration, all the mechanicals, naturally cooler, so we'll work less. Um, even during the summertime, that on the ground will be probably 50 degrees without refrigeration in it, so it'll keep the all the mechanicals working a lot less. Um, we came about this project for a couple of reasons. Again, um, to continue in the fishing industry and to also to work with the local fishermen. For years, we're trying to figure out how we can work together and how the industry can survive in situate because the way it had been going, fishermen are dropping out. Some of the older time guys aren't fishing anymore. You know, it, it would be a shame to see this industry disappear. So one thing that, you know, I developed with some of the fishermen is, you know, because it's a global market, on fish and their prices are reflected not only by what they catch, but what comes in on airplanes from Iceland, from Canada, from all over the world. You know, if they catch a hundred pounds of fish, which isn't that much, but there's 10,000 pounds of Icelandic haddock that's landed in Boston, that's fairly inexpensive that brings down the price of their fish, even though their fish should have been priced higher. Uh, so the fluctuation of price is very difficult to control because it is a global market. But what we kind of figured out is, you know, all businesses have costs. And a lot of the fishermen's costs are these costs that are incurred, you know, from when they land the boat, it goes on to a truck, it gets trucked to New Bedford or to uh, Boston, you know, there's 10 cents a pound to truck it, then there's auction fees, then there's brokerage fees, um, there's unloading and dock fees at some places. So all these fees add up to sometimes 10, 20, 30, 40 cents a pound. So if the fisherman's getting $2 a pound, but they have to pay 30, 40 cents a pound, they're really only getting $1.60. So what we're trying to eliminate is those excess of fees and by the fishermen being able to bring the fish in the situate, bring it right here to Mullaney's, get it processed at Mullaney's, they're, el they're eliminating those trucking fees, the, you know, all these fees I just talked about and that in sense gives them an increased price um, and a more stable price for them so that they can better forecast their businesses and, you know, their costs. Um, our new facility here is going to have a capability which is kind of unique of, you know, Kevin said that day boats here in situ are day boat fishing. So they can go out today, they can land tonight. They'll be in our building in the morning or tonight, filleted, packaged, and be able to be out to the final consumer tomorrow by noontime. You know, they can be out to restaurants. By tomorrow afternoon, they can be out on retails by noontime. So that fish is going to be less than 24 hours old from swimming to literally your plate. And that's kind of a unique situation because the way most fish distribution handles now, it, it does take much longer than that. I mean, it would go from the boat, go into Boston tomorrow, goes into someone's cooler tomorrow, gets reweighed, repacked, the next day it may get filleted, you know, it goes into a cool, it gets repacked again, it may go on another truck, it may get shipped around the country. Now it's two, three, four days later, it ends up in someone's warehouse at a supermarket. If they hadn't sold the fish that they had already, that fish that was brought in has to wait until it gets, the oldest stuff gets sold. And I talk maybe another day on it. So sometimes the fish you could get places could be five, six, seven, eight days old. Um, and fish, the old saying, fish is like guests. You don't want them too long. 
um, and it's true. So we're in a unique position where we can get that fish, day boat fish, high quality fish to the customer um, very quickly. And this is gonna help both the fishermen and Mulaney's and the end user as well. We also did uh, with this building, we wanna really try to make more value added foods for some of the fish species. So some of the fish that, you know, Kevin and Frank were talking about the red fish and the um, whiting and some of the bycatch fish, the, you know, monk and whatnot, um, they're not used as much and people aren't as familiar with them. So what we did is we put a commercial kitchen in our new building and we're going to make value added foods with some of these. So you might be able to come in and get fish tacos, which will be, you know, great fish taco, but it could be made with whiting or it could be made with hake. Um, you know, you might be able to get a dish of, you know, prosciutto wrapped monkfish, which you probably wouldn't try at home, but you may come in and be like, oh, that's something I might want to try to make. That'd be neat. Um, and again, this is going to add value to the fishermen's end price, um, which is a, a benefit to, to the fishermen and to um, the millennials as well. So what we're trying to do also is make sure that, you know, the traceability aspect of the fish, so that our customers will know that, you know, this fish that you're buying right here today came from the Miss Emily or came from the Cheryl Ann or came from any of the other boats in situ, and you're not presuming that it came from that, and it all, it could have came from Iceland or China or frozen, you know, fish from somewhere else that, you know, sometimes happens, which, you know, buyer beware. But people will be really able to understand that this fish did come from there. We'll have, you know, traceability software that'll be allowed the customer to be confident that this is where the fish came from. And it came from the Miss Emily on this day. Um, you know, the other aspect that Frank touched on briefly is, you know, the community aspect of what we're doing here in Situate. And, you know, we, we've been involved in the community and we're invested in the community. Like Kevin said, we're all family members here in the community. At the beginning of, of COVID, um, you know, we were very aware that, that um, excuse me, very aware that people were hurting. Um, excuse me, sorry about that. Uh, and what we did was we joined with one of the restaurant groups in Situate, a galley, Brian Houlihan, and with Kevin's help, Kevin donated a bunch of haddock, Brian and myself um, filleted it, and we made it into meals, and we got it out to about 400 households um, that needed it. We delivered home-cooked meals about 400 people, free of charge, um, no publicity, no, uh, you know, but we'll be able to do that more for Citroen community um, projects for the food pantry. We we'll wanna be able to provide fresh food to the food pantry. Um, we're also been in talks with the school systems in the area to be able to get fresh local fish into the schools. I, I think it's crazy that school systems don't have fish on their menus or in the coastal community. We did some um, some donations last year with the school systems where we went in and we baked local paddock, again donated by the Sector 12 fishermen. Um, we made fish tacos, we did some haddock dinners for the kids and they loved them. And we'll be able to get that kind of fish to the community at the same cost that they can put a hot dog on the plate, we'll be able to put a healthy, sustainable um, piece of fish on their plate. That's something that we're really looking forward to uh, doing going forward. Um, I don't know if I'm gonna be able to do it, but I'm gonna to try to give you a quick kind of look around at the new building here. Um, it may be a little jumpy because I'm on the computer, but we'll uh, try to take a walk here and get out of the office. You can hang that up there. Okay. Um, so we're going out into the processing room now, which will be the processing room. We'll be um, cutting, filleting, 
This whole room is refrigerated. Um, it's a big refrigerator cooler. The fish will come in outside and go to the loading dock and either come into that cooler or it will go down on a freight elevator down in the basement to the coolers downstairs. Um, now we're walking into the retail room here. I'll just give you a little, little view of you know, what, what we're going to be looking at. So we have you know, a display of some local fish here that came in, um, shellfish, whole fish, and some haddock and flounders and whiting. Uh, this retail room is really neat. Um, really excited to start loading up all these display cases uh, with fish. Uh, so to start walking around here, we got uh, a lobster tank, retail lobster tank with a uh, water will come in up top there and uh, cascade down those waterfalls. Upstairs here, excuse me. <laughs> Walk up the stairs. Be a little loud up here with some of the equipment, but um, the upstairs here is going to be, um, like I said, a, a shop where there'll be a lot of value added foods. There'll be a lot of value added foods, dinners to go. Um, you know, chowders and discs and crab cakes and stuffed cohogs and whatnot. Um, dinners that people can come in and take home and heat up themselves and have a really good, healthy, tasty meal. Uh, we have a commercial kitchen. Um, we'll be able to make everything. That's our pet shark up there, wooden shark. Um, let's just give you a little preview of of what we'll be doing. Hopefully we'll be opening it up in the next month or so. We're just waiting on some of the uh, last minute um, permits and things like that. But we're getting very close. We're very excited to uh, you know, open the doors and get the community in here and supply everyone with some uh, nice fresh fish. So with that, I'd say um, that's about all I have to say. I don't know if uh, you want to open up to questions, Jean or Frank? Or how you yeah, wanna... that'd be great. Um, we've got some questions that have actually already come through the, okay, um, the chat. chat there. Okay. Can you see them or do you want me to read them to you? No, I, I can see them here. Um, I'm just going to go downstairs. It's not as loud again. Sorry. Um, let's see. Uh, um, We, you will not be able to eat actually in the store. We, we will have a, um, a little area where we'll be able to take, you'll get um, local blue plate specials maybe where the, whatever the fishermen bring in that day, whatever the fishermen bring in that day, um, we'll make into maybe fish tacos that night or lobster rolls or a scallop dish or um, whatever happens to be. So we'll have three or four Blue Blade specials a couple nights a week, but you won't be actually to eat in the store. Um, because of COVID um, and space requirements, um, we sort of switched gears on that so that we won't um, be actual having in-store uh, seating. Uh, uh, will any of the local grocery stores be carrying a citric on fish? Uh, will Mulaney's store be the only retail outlet? Um, Mulaney's will probably be the only retail outlet. Um, you know, we may, we've been in talks with some of the grocery stores, the bigger grocery stores in the South Shore, who want to start carrying local sustainable fish, and we probably will be doing that down the road. Um, um, but do that down the road, but for now we'll, um, we'll be doing it all here. Uh, will scallops be sold at a store? Yes, they will be. They're always sold at a store. They're always local. Um, our scallops are never processed, never water added. They're always 100% um, um, just scallop meat. Uh, we never add water to them. A lot of places, you know, may see scallops at a supermarket or someplace that, you know, is 10 to 11 dollars a pound and you come into Mulaney's and they're 15 to 16 or 17 you're like well why is there a, such a big difference 
and it's because we don't add water to our scallops or any chemicals. What, what we uh, sell is what we take home for our families to eat, which is 100% natural food. So, uh, let's see what other. Did you see the question there from um, Chris Putnam? I didn't see Chris's question. I saw his comments so here. Let's see where he said, uh, okay, uh, when Malays and Sisters operate, will the local restaurants likely be promoting local fish? Will they be able to provide more information on when and where it's caught? Yes, uh, we do quite a bit of wholesale. Our business is probably made up of about 80% of our business is restaurants. Um, and we do locally. Uh, local area from Boston down to Plymouth. We specialize in all, all local fish. I mean, a lot of chefs sometimes will ask, you know, can I get bronzini or can I get red prawns from Argentina? My answer is not, not from me. If you want a local fish, if you want hake or you want a cod or a haddock or a sole or, you know, can I get a Dover sole? I said, no, you can't get Dover sole. It comes from the Mediterranean the other side of the world, the carbon footprint, the quality of it's not going to be the same. I can get you a gray sole that came off a boat here and situate yesterday that's beautiful and fresh and much more uh, of a better product. Um, so the restaurants will um, be able to have information on where their fish is. Uh, any of the restaurants we sell, you know, really try to promote the fact that they are buying local sustainable fish. Uh, we've got a question here from Randall Lyons that maybe you'll want to answer directly to him offline. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I've taken a copy of it and I can email okay. it to you if you'd like. Yeah, if you could do that, that'd be great. Yeah. Anybody else want to put a question into the chat? Anybody else who is not sure how to use the chat who wants to ask a question? Seth, can, can we unmute everyone or unmute them? Um, Good and Price has a question here with how many people uh, will be employing. Oh, okay. Uh, so we've been, Mulaney's used to employ probably about eight to 10 employees. Gearing up for our new building, we now have about um, 15 employees. And once we start processing fish, we'll probably have a uh, about 20 full-time employees, full-time employees. Okay. Nancy, did you have a question? No, just unmuted. Oh, okay. All right. Anybody have a question? Uh, no Tom, question, but... Oh, sorry, Tom. Go ahead. Yeah, I have one question. Hi, Chris. I have one question. What can we do as a consumer to really make a difference? Obviously, sales and something like that. But what, what can we do as situate people to really spread the word, Joby and Frank and uh, Kevin? I think, I think the best thing that as consumers can do um, to help the local fishing industry and, you know, situate in general is to make sure you're getting local sustainable fish when you buy it at a restaurant or someplace. You know, don't be afraid to ask and you sit down, you know, where do you get your fish from? Mm. Um, you know, unfortunately, you know, the restaurants, it's a tough business and they're very price sensitive. Um, so I, I certainly understand if a fish, if a restaurant can't in their business plan afford a local fish, well, they may have to buy a frozen product um, and sell it. But, you know, as a consumer, you can ask, you know, is this local or is this Canadian or Icelandic? And if it isn't, you know, you can say to them, you know, listen, I'd, I'd really like to buy this, but I'm trying to shop more local, you know? And I think if more people do that, restaurants will understand that, you know, it, it's, a, it's a consumer preference and they'll follow the suit that way. Mm -hmm. Okay. Anyone else? It's, it's Christian. I just have one question in terms of uh, promotion outside of Situate. I think, you know, most of us here in Situate realize the value that local seafood brings and, and that we're supporting local small businesses, local families. Are there any plans that you gentlemen know of to um, promote Situate as a, a venue to get fresh local seafood and, and come to the restaurants helping 
the entire town in terms of increasing cash flow into the town. Well, I, I think that's part of the, the, the business plan is to be able to, you know, really promote local sustainable seafood through all the restaurants and as a community from the fishermen to the restaurants, to the retail, have people come to sit with us and be like, oh, that's a, you know what, that's a cute little fishing town. And it is a cute little fishing town. But we also want to be able to let people know outside the community that, you know, it's situate supplies fish to, you know, normal public schools possibly or other areas because this, the amount of fishermen in situate is very unique. There's not many fishing ports left um, in the state. I mean, you have situate, you have Boston, you have New Bedford, you have Gloucester, you know, there's, there's no Plymouth anymore. There's no, you know, there's no commercial fleets in many harbors anymore. And situate's yeah. very unique that they still have one. and It should be preserved. Very true. Thank you, Frank, um, Kevin, Joby. Thank you very much. This has been great. Thanks, Chris. Thank you. You're welcome. I've got a question for Kevin. Sure. Kevin, at one time, Situate had a number of boats that fished swordfish. Why, why, don't, why aren't we fishing swordfish out of Situate anymore? Well, basically, well, most of the swordfish boats are just, uh, they're, almost, they're almost too big for Situate. You know, they're, 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 they're going so far for sword now. You know, they're, they're fishing the Grand Banks and Georges. I mean, most of the boats that are doing it are in the 100-foot range. And the Situate Town Pier just doesn't have the room for boats that size anymore. Uh, you know, we, we, we try to keep that, that pier to having about a, a dozen boats in the, you know, 60, 60, 50, 60 foot range. And if we start putting, you know, larger vessels on there, it just takes up too much space and uh, there's just not enough room for it. And, and those boats are, uh, you know, they're basically fishing out of places like New Bedford and Gloucester with its bigger harbors. And, and they have capabilities of, you know, getting fuel and ice. Situate's kind of in the middle of nowhere for, to, to get stuff, you know? And those boats come in, they want to ice up, fuel up and go. And, you know, in Situate here, and that's another big problem with us is, you know, we, we can get fuel, but it's not, you know, as cheap as it is in other fishing ports. And ice we have to have delivered by truck. You know, we're, we're, we're definitely off the beat path where, you know, a larger swordfish boat wants to pull into a new Bedford or a Gloucester or a Boston, they want to unload, get fuel and ice and be, be gone again. Okay, thanks. I have a question. This is Betty Tfangshin. Um, I'm sick of my own cooking. When can I start buying? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, yeah, I'll, I'll turn you around. They're still doing some work outside here, Betty. Wow. But, um, <laughs> but it's, and it's eight o'clock at night on a Thursday. But um, soon, we're hoping, you know, that we'll be able to open the doors within the next month. We want to get in here and work for a couple of weeks, work all the kinks out. Um, but we're hoping, you know, by mid-March that we'll be uh, able to open up. I'll be there. <laughs> okay, good. Frank, have you got anything you want to add to the end of this presentation? One quick thing, uh, just to supplement what Joby said, don't be afraid to be adventurous. Try different kinds of fish. You know, cake is wonderful. Whiting is wonderful. Pollock is wonderful. Redfish. All these species that uh, people don't recognize, um, it's not because there's anything wrong with them. It's just that they're not the, uh, the brand that um, cod and haddock have, you know, the, the recognizable brand identity. So, be adventurous and try something new. You'll be really pleasantly surprised. Great. Anybody else? I got Any one more? more. I got one more comment. The processor is really a game changer for Situate. Um, will Will that be able to do something like I go back to like social media or something alerts about what you got now, Joby and Kevin, that kind of thing to uh, you know, smaller uh, species coming in. So slash subscriptions, some way to keep that going. Well, we're hoping with some of the traceability aspects that we'll be putting in place, that you know, you'd be able to get a notification saying, you know what, the family came in today, they had yellowtail sole, they had some whiting, they had a paddock, um, 
and you'd be able to either, you know, order from a website or, you know, come down and purchase something to the store that way as well. But you'd be able to know what came in, when it came in, yeah. um, you know, how it was caught, you know, it, hopefully with the technology, we'd like to be able to have, you know, you'd be able to look at the fish, scan it with your cell phone, and it would say, oh, geez, this came off the Miss Emily or the Sherrilyn on this day at this location in the ocean. It would give you all the information that you could possibly ever want on that piece of fish, you know? Let me just quickly add to that, too. I'm also working on a, a – I'm putting a Wi-Fi system on the boat and a camera system on my boat where hopefully – you'll be able to live stream, watch us fish, you know? So I'm going to have a story that people can watch us fish, they can watch what comes out of the net, and watch how we process it. Joby, I have a question. Joby, yeah. Joby when am I going to hear about that job that I applied for down at the store? <laughs> <laughs> Keep waiting by the mailbox. I think we'll yeah. The letter will be coming out shortly. If you don't get to it, I'll just, just wait. We'll get it's to it. Yeah. Got a couple more questions, Joby. Um, uh, cooking classes on site by any chance? Cooking classes are definitely something <laughs> we'd be doing. We talked to a lot of the chefs uh, um, that we do business with, um, and we're going to be doing cooking classes upstairs where we'll have guest chefs come in and they'll be able to teach you know people some very good, easy seafood recipes that they can make at home. Great. Then we have, would you consider offering a community support fishery share option? So much, so much fish per month offered as part of a share. You know, we, we've looked into some of the, something like that before, and there was a program like that before. The only problem with that is the timing of it, because sometimes people just want to pick up the fish on a Friday or something like that. Um, and if the fishing boats don't go out Wednesday or Thursday, it's either not available on a Friday or the fish would have to be three days old and we're not gonna sell it to someone that's you know three days old fish. So it's a little different than you know, a, you know, a farm share where a farm, they can go out and they can harvest you know, more or less day after day. Um, you know, fishing relies so much on weather and availability of different species. It's, it's, we haven't figured out a way to do that officially and uh, it would be beneficial to the fishermen and the final consumer yet. So, but we're working on something like that. It's just, it's, there's a lot of moving parts in it. Great. So I think, is that it, everybody? Anybody else? Alan, you have a question? Ellen? No? All right, I think that's it. Wow. Well, that's a you wonderful presentation. Again. Thank you well, all. Frank, are you still there? I'm here. Thank you very Thank much. You. For you. Well, thanks to everybody that gave such a thoughtful question, Dylan. It's really great that the community is so interested in what we're doing. I really appreciate it. Very exciting. And we appreciate you coming in and doing this for us. That's great. Very educational. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank this you. was fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Frank. Hey. And Marie, how are you? <laughs> nice job, all three of you. That was Thank awesome. You. Thank you. All right, everybody. Thank you for joining us. And, um, We'll see you, uh, is it in two weeks, I believe, for our next presentation, which is um, the Lincoln assassination with Christopher Daly. So we hope you'll join us. Jane? Yes? Can, can we get on a mailing list? <laughs> yeah. Why don't you send me an email? Okay. Jen? Yeah, I already, you uh, sent me an email to let me know I got into the, I registered, so. Okay. So just drop me another email. Say, please put me on the mailing list. Thank you, Jane. Okay, you're welcome. Anybody else who'd like to get on the mailing list? It's G-A-R Hall Events <laughs> at gmail.com. Gmail.com.
I didn't yep, get it. Just send me an email and we'll get you on the mailing list. And if you don't, um, just keep checking our Facebook page, Situate Historical Society. We post all the presentations. And this presentation, actually, the video will be on there tomorrow.